Hello everyone! Today we're going to start off a silly new series called Breaking the Economy. Because The Frontier is an economics-heavy campaign, because our channel has a history of in-game economics videos, and of course because we personally love that sort of stuff in TTRPGs. Going forward, we're going to talk about both Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition and Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and go about disproving many of the economics-based myths surrounding TTRPGs, and talk about how you can use the rules of the game that we already have, as well as some expansions we've made ourselves with input from the wider community, to completely annihilate the economic status quo normally presented in these games and sometimes even other TTRPGs. We hope to collaborate with other TTRPG enthusiasts on YouTube during this series and help GMs come to terms with wild and crazy business ventures by players that have absolutely every intention of incorporating business into their role-playing experience. Today we won't be giving any specific examples, but instead we're going to cover some more immediate concerns and myths about the economy in these sort of games. Rest assured, we've been around the block enough and through more than enough TTRPGs to have heard most concerns, but we do encourage others to bring up more in the comments section down below, as these are mostly surface level issues. If we think it's germane, we may well be doing more videos like this one in facing down the myths of in-game economies and the potential problems with running more economically motivated parties. Adventuring makes more money than business and trade. This is, without a doubt, the single most common retort we hear when we bring up what, that we want our characters to be economically motivated, have land, businesses, crafting workshops, run caravans, be merchants, etc. It's the number one statement that Big Shot Game articles make about running businesses and caravans and the like whenever we look up articles about these sorts of things, going out of their way to say it before they ever even bother getting into the hypotheticals of a D&D or Pathfinder party running a business. To this, we have but two simple questions of clarification. What are you on? And can we have some? The very idea of this statement flies in the face of literally every major campaign hook and mid-level intrigue mission we've ever been in. We'd be inclined to say that over three quarters of all adventure paths and modules specifically involve some rich non-adventure hiring out the party for some job. These employers are almost always merchants or landowning nobles or some other kind of well-to-dos that need you to protect their businesses, caravans, temples, mansions, factories, mines, vineyards, festivals, menageries, castles, secret lairs, <gasps> and sometimes family members. They're often willing to spend hilarious amounts of money that the party gawks at and gets excited about, dutifully tallying off the potential items they'll be able to buy that will let them live what we call mission to mission. For whatever reason, this paltry sum of money is seemingly good enough for even the wise hagglers of the party, who seldom get more than 20% extra from their hard work and smooth negotiating. However, nobody needs to question whether or not this will bankrupt these wealthy aristocrats and outgoing merchant lords. Of course not! Some GMs and venture paths will even include that the employer has tried to get many parties to fix pr this problem before, but all have failed. If it were the case that adventuring was universally more profitable than running businesses and producing cool products and stuff like that, this wouldn't happen. The players would be the ones hiring merchants to run everything for them that while they were gone, tearing down ancient temples and raiding the rotting towers of demi-liches. Entire societies would dedicate themselves to training children from toddlerhood for strict adventuring lifestyles, and everything from farming to inventing new things to help with quality of life would be set to the side as people everywhere would know that adventuring was the best. Whole cultures would be built around adventuring, and merchants would simply grovel at the feet of the real breadwinners like some sort of perpetual maiden of this fan world. But that's never what we see. It's always some fat, rich muckety-muck who's never seen the sharp end of a spear hiring the adventurers to do something that he'd never do himself with the money that he has in his pockets alone. It's the party stopping off at the tavern to see what bounty orders are out by Lord Shackleton or Great Viscount Hornby, possibly to clear out the dire rats in his cellar or the Otiugs in his cesspit for all we care. Rest assured, being a land-owning producer of goods and or profit-chasing merchant of high-quality wares will get you a lot more coin than mere adventuring, and is not mutually exclusive to it. 
You can both manage a business in-game and be part of a regular adventuring party and not have to worry about the two clashing, or even have to leave the city of Absalom in the case of worlds like Galarian. In fact, having a string of businesses, huge tracts of land, and or all manner of money-related attachments can give the GM many more hooks to throw at the party, potentially more than any one party could ever handle. D&D and Pathfinder aren't economics games. I'm not playing a TTRPG to make spreadsheets and count profits. Isn't it, though? Aren't you, though? You don't seem to understand the core principles of most adventurers if you think this. You go out, you get loot, you sell loot for money, and then you save that money up for better equipment to go on grander and more profitable adventures and then do it all over again. And let's be real with ourselves and talk about the hilariously advanced spreadsheets and quest lists that people can make. Just a D&D character sheet by itself is already a ridiculous masterwork of on-paper organization that people literally have to have help to understand when they first set eyes upon it. We look at any Pathfinder or D&D book, and it's full of tables and equations and special buzzwords that nobody else would understand. How is this any different, and why would you want to push that experience away? RPGs are a way for people to escape reality and live their wildest fantasies. Well, our wildest fantasy is to be rich and do cool things with money. That should be something GMs allow. Not merely turn every adventure into a reason to go shopping, but instead to reinvest in cool, in-universe opportunities that can help get your players more involved, immerse, and invested into your game world. Maybe the systems aren't necessarily built for the strain of more economic and socio-political interactions. We'll grant you that. With Pathfinder, this is very difficult, because it doesn't have a trade goods baseline like D&D does, but even then we've always found it's just more fun for everyone involved to try if it's in the minds of the players to do so. It's fun to work with players and GMs to figure out what new things cost, to invent new ways of handling something in a system, and overall just to have fun making stuff with each other. And if you really like what you've done with each other, and feel really proud of it, you can do what we do and show it to the rest of the world and see what they think. Worst comes worst, don't yuck someone's yum, you know? We're all just here to have fun. If my party is super rich, won't it imbalance the game? Well, yes. But that's not a problem, and we'll explain why. There comes a point when characters get big enough and powerful enough that their concerns and quests are more than just doing a job for someone or getting an item from one place to another. They get the idea that they want to make something of their own that isn't in the manual, or head out to a part of the game world that isn't made, or go back to an NPC you never intended to revisit because they just like the guy so much they want to know more about him. And you should let them do that. Not only does it enhance the fun for your party, but it stresses your capacity to improve as a GM. It tells you what your players want from you as a GM, and it gives you opportunities to produce more of the story around those wants and needs. And, if we're to be honest with ourselves, we all know the players, first and foremost, largely desire most of all to imbalance the game. Whether it be murder hobos trying to unlock one-hit kills on nearly every creature in the game, or necromancers trying to create entire literal armies of undead to overwhelm any enemy the GM can produce, overreaching is an ancestral and we'd say necessary component of the human experience. You're not going to convince your party to stay within the confines of your campaign's comfort zone. No campaign setting survives first contact with the PCs. And that's the way it should be. Because one's role as GM of a TTRPG, with exception, should never be the GM versus the players. If you have any choice in the matter, and as the GM you pretty much always do, you should always run your campaigns as... The world in response to the players. If they want to break the economy, let them do that and then present to them the natural consequences of their actions. In our experience, the consequences of their actions tends to be the Frontier Party's main enemy, and they've never jeopardized the game, only made it more fun for everyone involved. Isn't making a campaign around economics boring? 
For some, certainly. We're aware that our characters' economic shenanigans and our Saturday morning Pathfinder game are very fun and entrancing to our GM and maybe one other player, but otherwise makes the party fighter's eyes glaze over, and the party psychic's eyes roll so hard they practically fall out of his head. Our GM makes up for this by allowing us to bring all manner of crazy ideas to him off-screen, and then explain to the party what we're doing at the start and or end of any given session, after and or right before we carry out one of our characters' big ideas. While it might seem like a bit of a bore, it gives no shortage of opportunities for the GM to spice things up. Businesses and colonies on the edge of society are not static things, and the world is never static while your party moves around. Anywhere that success is made, you'll find people trying to stymie it or steal it. And if the party doesn't go on an adventure to some faraway land, the adventure will come to them. As we like to say, for every step the party takes, the rest of the world takes a step as well. Anytime the party chooses not to take a step, the rest of the world still gets the opportunity to take a step anyway. The best thing, as a GM, to do if you have one or more characters vary into the economic and socio-political aspect of the game and others that aren't, in our opinion, is to find out who is interested and to what level and maintain a sort of compartmentalization approach to it. Our party's fighter would lose his mind if he was made to take part in all the number crunching and business planning. Our party's monk, on the other hand, has always been extremely excitable and good-humored about it. Whereas the party psychic has no interest in it, but is more than happy to be part of it because he likes being a part of the party and collaborating with people. From here on, just try to figure out how to balance interactions and keep your options open. We think it's pretty fun, for example, when the session starts and we go, okay, so we have something to tell everyone, via NOS, there have been updates to the plan, and everyone else will go, oh man, what's going on this week, NOS? The people who pay attention have helped, and the people who don't and haven't paid attention are surprised that we've suddenly put together a literal orphanage in a few days using the money that anyone else in the party would have used to buy magic items or special gear. It's just as fun to magically arrive with treats and gifts for the entire party. At one point, we spent the proceeds from her business to buy the entire party clockwork grappling guns so we could all travel around like Batman. We have heard no complaints so far. Regardless of your personal position on it, try to allow your players to get into business and landowning and all that stuff if they really want to. There is very little reason not to let your players just dedicate themselves to these fancies if they can do so in the background and are still having fun doing it. Even if it ends up getting them hilariously rich and unbalances the game, which isn't guaranteed, you don't have to punish them or limit them for it. Try instead expanding your world to it. Make things bigger. Let your players help make things bigger with and for you. It's a lot of fun. Have fun with that.